heard a story a long time ago, and I have a coconut that always reminds me of that story. And it's a story about how in some parts of the world, they trap monkeys. And here's what they do. They take a coconut, one that's probably a little bigger than this one, and they, they hollow it out, and they make a hole in it, just large enough for the hand of a monkey to fit into the hole. And then what they do is they put nuts and different things in the, in the uh, coconut to attract the monkey. And then they secure the, the, uh, the coconut to a tree. Here's what happens. The monkey smells the food, is attracted to the food, comes to the coconut and slides its hand into the coconut where it grabs the nuts. Well, now it's got a problem. It can't pull its hand out as long as it's holding on to the food. And so it keeps moving its hand around, trying to get its hand out, but you can't get the hand out because the hole isn't large enough for the hand and the food to come out. And it'll keep doing this until somebody comes sees the monkey, and it sees the person coming and works hard to get, it can't get the coconut away until finally, until finally, the person comes, picks up the monkey, makes it let go of the food to take its hand out, and now the, now the monkey is captive. The reason I love that story is because it's my story. And it's a story of, of many who are here today. It's not bananas or nuts or fruit that we're attracted to, but it's money. And we stick our hand into the coconut and we grab a hold of the money that we think is going to bring life, is going to bring peace, is going to bring joy. We reach in for the things that we think are going to bring happiness. And what happens is, we don't let go and we can't get our hand out. And the reality is we become enslaved. We become slaves to our money and our love for money. The problem is not the coconut. The problem isn't the fruit in the coconut. The problem is the greed of the monkey. For us, the problem isn't money. The problem isn't possessions. The problem we have and what enslaves us is the love that we have for money and the confidence and trust we put in money to provide what it is that we are to look to God to provide in our lives. And so what happens to us when our hand is grabbing on to money and grabbing on to things, what happens to us is we get trapped. We get trapped by our own fear, believing that we will never have enough and God will not provide. We get trapped by our own greed, wanting things that God does not intend for us to have. What I have found is that over the years as I have deepened in my faith, and I shared a little bit about that last week, what God has enabled me to do is to let go and I pull my hand out and suddenly I'm free. Free from fear, free from worry and anxiety, free to trust God in my life, free from the desires of things that God does not intend me to have. And friends, we are preaching this series because we want you to experience that kind of freedom. You see this picture on the screen, and it's, yeah, that's a monkey. And um, you can see the little, that coconut's a little bigger than mine. But I think this is often the attitude we have when it comes to the things of this world. We say to God, I'm not letting go. I'm going to hold on to this. And what we think is that this thing that we're holding on to is going to bring life. What we think is that this thing that we're holding on to is going to bring peace. And the reality is just the opposite. It's these very things that enslave our hearts. 
It's these very things that rob us of all the wonderful things that God wants for us. Peace and joy and freedom and faith and trust. And so I want to ask you this question this morning. Is that a picture of you? Of course, you look nicer. <laughs> you might be wearing a tie or a suit this morning. But I think that's, sometimes that's me. And I have to fight that in my life. I have to fight that. This morning, we're continuing a series. If you're visiting with us, we're, called, we're calling Unstoppable Generosity. And we're preaching on this because it's one of the values of Cross Point Church. The God that we worship is a God whose generosity knows no limits and no bounds. God said that he loved you enough that he gave his one and only son. That you may believe in him and have life with God, relationship with God now and forevermore. God is the ultimate giver. And because God is a God who is generous by his nature, we are called to reflect the nature of God. And we are called to be generous. And of all the attributes of God, the ones that I think are often are most difficult for us as American Christians are mercy, forgiveness, and generosity. Because these are things that fly in the face of the values of the culture in which we live. In your bulletin this morning, you have a little handout that looks like this. And has the picture of some different things that are connecting together. And with the arrow, what we're challenging, the challenge we want to bring to you as we're bringing to our children, as we're bringing to our youth ministry, all ages at Cross Point right now are going through this series. We want to begin with being a beginning giver. Maybe you've never given before. And this is something that you're just beginning to learn about. And you sense the Spirit of God challenging you to become a consistent giver. One who gives on a consistent basis. And from there, to take the next step to become a tithing giver, which we'll talk about this morning. And then from there, to become an expanding giver. We're going to talk a little bit about that this morning, to the point where we become an extravagant giver. It's not about how much we give. Extra extravagance isn't about how much we give. Extravagance is about having a heart that gives as God leads us in our lives. And so we want to encourage you to hold on to this and to ask yourself honestly, where am I in that list? Where am I in that progression? What, what level am I at now and what would it take for me and my family to go to the next step? If you have your Bibles with you, this morning we're going to be looking at a passage in the Old Testament. And as we do that, I want to invite you to turn to Malachi chapter 3. It's the very last book in the Old Testament. It's the last book in the Old Testament. And this is a passage that may be new to many of you. But God is going to bring a challenge to the people. Because they have walked away from him. And they're confused. God, how are we doing this? And God answers their question. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to verse 6 of Malachi chapter 3. We read the word of the Lord. God says, I the Lord do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees, from my commands, from my laws, and have not kept them. Return to me, listen to the promise of God, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? And God says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? And the Lord responds, in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test that there may be food in my house. Test me in this 
says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord God Almighty. Will you pray with me? Father, in these challenging words, we want to hear your voice. God, we want to understand what it is that you want to say to us. Lord, we want to be those who follow you, who love you, who are faithful to you. Lord, we want to walk with you. We want to serve you. And Lord, we just want to give as you lead us in our lives. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a few things that I want you to see, and here's the first one. Generosity is also a theme of the Old Testament. Over the last weeks, as we've been talking about unstoppable generosity, what we've talked about is that generosity is a theme, as we have seen, of the New Testament. We looked at a variety of different teachings, 2 Corinthians, 1 Timothy. We've looked at the, the Gospels and the example and the teachings of Jesus. We've seen that generosity is to be a, a value of our lives reflecting the heart and the nature and the character of God himself. But we also see that this is a major theme of the Old Testament, so it's a major theme of the entire scriptures. Here is just one example in Deuteronomy chapter 12. To that place you must go, there bring your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, which you have vowed, listen to this, which you have vowed to give and your free will offerings and the firstborn of your herds and your flocks. What I want you to see this morning, and you'll see some different ways of giving. We have offerings, burnt offerings, sacrifices, tithes, special gifts, free will offerings. These are all different ways that the people worshiped God and in their hearts were generous as a response to this reality. God owns everything. You see, when we give to the Lord, we are reminding ourselves God owns everything. God doesn't need our money to do the work that he wants to do, but he has chosen to work through the gifts that we give to accomplish the work that he has chosen to do. And what we see in the scriptures are two basic themes when it comes to giving. The first, as we've read in both passages, the one in Malachi and Deuteronomy 12, is a tithe. A tithe translates literally to the English a tenth part. And what it meant was that the people were to give the first 10% everything that they received to the Lord. That's what the tithe is. If you give 1%, that's not a tithe. The tithe is the first 10% of what we give to the Lord. It's called a tenth part. But actually, the people gave much more than that. There were other ways to give. The tithe was the money that went to support the Levites, who were basically in charge. They were the priests the class of, of priests. They were in charge of the temple and the tabernacle. And so it was their responsibility to lead the worship of the nation. And they were supported through the tithes of the people. But the people actually gave more than that. Um, with the other requirements, they gave about 23.5% was the amount that they actually gave for the work that the Lord was doing in Israel and through Israel to the surrounding nations. But there was another way to give, and that was called the offering. The offering, when you read about the offering, it's what we give in addition to the tithe. So we give the Lord the first 10%, and when we give beyond that, that's called the offering. Now, I know that there are some people who have heard the teaching that the tithe is only Old Testament. That the tithe isn't something that's required of Christians. I've heard that teaching, I understand it. And there's two ways that I would respond to that. Number one, the tithe existed before Moses. The tithe existed 
before the law was given to Moses. Before we received the Mosaic law, we see that Abraham and Jacob, they tithed to the Lord. And so the tithe existed before the law was given to us through Moses. The second thing I would mention is that God does not tend to, uh, to for us to give less. What, he see, what we see in the New Testament is Jesus talks about sacrificial giving. What we see the Apostle Paul talk about in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is sacrificial giving. Now, a tithe to some will be sacrificial. A tithe to others is not sacrificial. They have so, many, so much in the way of resources, a tithe is not sacrificial. But we are called by Jesus to give sacrificially. When we see Jesus respond to the commands of God, we see that he deepens them. Remember what he said about adultery. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. He said this in the Sermon on the Mount. But I tell you, if you even look at another with lust in your heart, then you've already committed adultery with that person. Jesus deepens the commands of God. And we see in the New Testament that we are to give sacrificially for the work of the Lord. And so we see this, this tithe, we see this offering. But let's go even deeper. God has a concern that we give to the world. One of the things that I have loved is the way that God challenges the people to give beyond the tithe in the Old Testament. Listen, here's one example that comes from Leviticus, and it has so many implications for how you and I live in the world today. Listen to what he said. Leviticus 19.10, do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick the grapes that have fallen. Why? God said, leave them for the poor and leave them for the foreigner, for I am the Lord your God. That is a profound challenge to how you and I live in our place, in this area, in 2018. God said, I have given you an, um, an abundance. Do not make sure that you get every little morsel, but make sure that you give those morsels, that which is left after the picking, and let them stay there so that the poor can come to your land and they can, they can glean food from your land to survive. And the foreigner was the person who was going through Israel from one nation to another. God wasn't just concerned about the poor in Israel. He was concerned about the foreigner as well. God said, let us, let us provide for them so that they too may know that I am the Lord, their God. What I want you to see in this is that the Lord loves people. And through generosity, as we give in the name of the Lord, as we give in obedience to the Lord, as he calls each and every one of us to give, as we give, the Lord is honored. The Lord is blessed because the glory goes to him. Isn't that a beautiful picture of God? And the heart of God. So what does it mean for us as we look at this passage in Malachi? I just want to share quickly a few things. Number one, what I want you to see is that immediately what the, God said, what the Lord says to the people in verse 6 of chapter 3 of Malachi is this. He says, the Lord is unchanging. He said, I the Lord do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Here's what God is saying. I have entered into a covenant with you, and you can trust my word. You can build your life in faith upon the words that I have given to you. For I, the Lord, does not, do not change. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but to me, that is absolutely profound and encouraging. You see, the false gods of the neighboring nations were very fickle. And what they believed in the neighboring nations about these false gods was that they were constantly changing their mind. God does not change. What I see about God in Genesis chapter 1 is the God I see at the end of Revelation is the God that I see today is the God that I will see tomorrow. 
He does not change. So why does God say that in the context of this passage? Because he is going to convict the people of their sin. But he's also reminding them that he will not destroy them. Even though they have been a stiff-necked, disobedient people, like many of us, God says, I will not destroy you. I will be faithful to the covenant that I established with you. And so God is saying here that the Lord is unchanging. And we need to see the nature of God from Genesis to Revelation, and we need to express that nature and character of God in and through our own lives. For God does not change. He was a generous God in Genesis. He was a generous God in Exodus. He was a generous God in Malachi. He was a generous God in the book of Matthew. He was a generous God in the book of Acts. He was a generous God throughout the epistles and the book of Revelation. God does not change. And we are to reflect his heart for people by being generous so that the church of Jesus Christ may be generous in our world, in our culture, ultimately for this purpose, that God may be glorified. That people would see how we live and see that we are not driven by money, that we are not afraid, that we are not controlled by money, that we are not selfish, but that we are giving generous people because the God that we worship is a generous and giving God. And they see that through the visible manifestation of the body of Christ, which is her church. The church, the church of Jesus Christ, it's his church. We are the bride of Christ. And the world knows who God is by what they see in us. So the question becomes, what is the picture that we are presenting? Here's the second thing I want you to see. It, and then it naturally follows that the Lord will restore all of those and he will forgive all of those who repent. To repent simply means to change the way I live. God says to the people, you are robbing from me. You are stealing from me, God says. Now repent, change the way you are living. Live in a new way. Be one whose life is marked by obedience to God, reflecting the heart of a generous God. It is the Lord who has given you your wealth. That's what the Bible teaches. All that you have belongs to God. And we need to discern as individuals what it is that God is calling us to give. Beth and I believe that the minimum is the tithe and that we are to give an offering in addition to that. We read here, ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees. You have not kept them. But then God says this, return to me, and I will return to you. For many years, I did not give. I was not generous as the Lord was calling me to give and to be generous. But then God put his hand upon my life, and he challenged me. But friends... I repented in joy, not in fear. I wanted to live as God had created me to live. I wanted to be free. I wanted my hand out of that coconut. I didn't want to live like that anymore. I wanted to be free to love God and to be loved by God, to experience the wonderful blessing that comes from not being selfish, from not being tight financially, but being generous. And to give as the Lord calls me to give. And when we do that, God blesses. Now, I don't do it for blessing. I do it out of obedience. But it doesn't matter what your past has been. Today can be the first day of living in a new way. And so we come to the next point. Withholding from the Lord what he has commanded us to give is stealing from him. When we don't give as the Lord calls us to give, then we are stealing from him. I remember when I read this, and living in disobedience in this area of my life as a young believer, and I remember thinking, wow, God, that's, I, I could try to tell myself I was being a good steward and being responsible, but bottom line, I was robbing God. Here's what he said to the people. How are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? 
yet you rob me. But you ask, how, do we, how are we robbing you? And God says, in tithes and offerings. You're not being obedient, God said. This is pretty clear teaching from my perspective of the scriptures. But I want you to hear what research shows about the American church today. The average evangelical committed believer, Christian, gives about 4% of their income. The average confessing Christian in a church gives about 2.4% of their income, of the first fruits that God has provided. 37% of, of the people in every average church in America do not give at all. Now this is something that really shocked me. Listen to this. For families making less than 20000 a year, that's poverty level, right? 8% of them tithe. For families making a minimum of 75000 or more a year, 1% gives. You see, some of us think, well, when I get more, I'll give more. It doesn't work that way. Because it's not a reflection of what I have in my wallet. It's a reflection of what I have in my heart. Does that make sense? It's a reflection of my faith and trust. Now, friends, I know that this is a hard thing, a hard sermon to hear. I don't mind preaching it because I love you. And I want the best for you. And here's what I want you to see. The Lord's blessings come to those who follow and obey him. Friends, when I do and live the way God wants me to live, doing what he wants me to do, I am most free. Because I am living as I was created to live. Joy and peace come through living the life I was made to live. And the same is true for you. Listen to what it says. God says, test me in this. Test me in this. Test me in what? In what God's about to say. And maybe you hear the Lord saying that to you today. Test me in this. Listen to what he says. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven... And pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now that blessing may not be money. Money isn't our deepest need. The world tells us that, but it's not true. That's not our deepest need. God wants to open your heart to amazing, amazing blessings. And that's a teaching that's not just for the people at the time of Malachi. But we see this repeated throughout Scripture. You see it in the Psalms. We saw it just a few weeks ago when we looked at 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this. Whoever sows or plants sparingly will reap sparingly, right? If I don't plant much in the way of crops, I'm not going to get many crops. But God says whoever sows or plants generously, God will give generously. Now the question becomes, are we willing to test God in that? Are we willing to trust God in that? I want to read to you an amazing testimony that came from a member of our church, Christina Toland. And she sent this to me a few weeks ago and I read it and it just so stirred my heart that I knew I had to share it with you at some point in this series. And yes, she does have, uh, I did get permission to read this. Some of you are thinking, oh. I sent him something too. <laughs> so you going to read that? No, I always ask first. I don't ask my family, but everybody else I ask. I want you to hear this because it's the journey that we've been talking about. This was from a few years ago. January 12th was the date that we were going to start tithing. It was always something my husband had wanted to do, but being so poor with five kids... Him in and out of work and barely scraping by each month, I always resisted. How can I tithe when I don't have enough money to make it through each month? The constant worry of if the food would last and will that bill get paid 
or he has one more, or, or one of the boys has outgrown his shoes, and I have two dollars to my name. When I thought over my excuses, I was reminded that my kids have never, ever missed a meal. The Lord always showed up and provided for them. People would always give us a bag of fruit here, a dozen eggs there. My bills were not late, and that, um, and that the only time I had two dollars to buy my son's shoes, the Lord provided two pairs at the thrift store for that two dollars that I, he had provided for me. So I told my husband, let's go over our budget, let's figure out our money, and plan to tithe in baby steps. January and February we knew would be super tight months. February was deep in red with bills due. We figured that we would give 5% and then hope for the best. Now 5 or 10% of our, of our check was pretty small, but to us was very big. So this was a big deal. Uh, later in January, I gave my first tithe ever, and I felt good about it. We were nervous and asked for prayer during the service, but I felt better. January 13th came, and I felt like my, I had been slapped upside my head. During my Bible study time, God spoke to me in a very big and clear way. He showed me that King Saul was asked to destroy a certain people group, and he only did it halfway. In Gideon's time, the people were asked to obey God, and they only did it halfway. In fact, countless times, the Israelites were asked to obey God, and they didn't fully obey. God could not give them his full blessing if they were not willing to obey his commands fully. Obey fully his commands was the message. That was me. I was not obeying fully. The thought tore at my heart and brought me to my knees. January 15th came. It was the prayer group. I handed over the complete 10% tithe. I got it off my chest so the Lord could leave me alone about it. <laughs> I've been there. He likes to nag me till I comply. I handed it over and the people prayed that God would provide and see us through. During that week, God provided seven meals for my family. People inviting us over to eat, giving us food, bringing a meal to us. I kept track. I could see God providing. And on top of all of that, God provided me what I needed, a mentor. Things were getting exciting now. God provided money for my oldest son to go to winter camp. Over, and then for my other son to go to Canada. Um, he even gave me a, pedicure, a pedicure, and someone gave me two bags of clothes. God was blessing. Now, hand-me-down clothes are always hit and miss. Usually, they're a mess. I opened the, <laughs> I opened the bags of, bag of clothes to look through them, and not only were they beautiful and expensive, at least to me, but they were all the exact size that we needed. He said it was like God went shopping just for me and blessed me with all these beautiful clothes. I was dumbfounded. He gave me a new friendship later that week, and that's where I got the pedicure. It was like God was saying to me, not only am I going to take care of you, but I'm going to spoil you too. That same week, God, uh, we went for food to Food for Life and served there. Another answer to prayer, Lord, give me a place where our kids can serve. That is something we always wanted for them, a place where they can look beyond themselves to help others. Not only that, but they gave us food there too. The month is almost over and my kitchen is overflowing with food. Praise God. We were invited to be part of a life group, which had never happened to us. Not that we haven't tried. We were never part of the in crowd to be in one. But again, this was another answer to prayer. February was the month where there would be no possible way we could provide and tithe and pay our, all of our bills. We turned in our taxes and got the biggest refund in our lives we had tied, and then it wasn't until the next day that I realized our tax return was so big because God was blessing us for being faithful. And hear this. Then it scared me that I almost missed it. I prayed, dear God, don't ever let me miss your blessings. We bought our homeschool curriculum for the next year, paid off two major bills and all the extra ones for the month, and there was still money in the bank. Test me, God said. And see what I will do. Let me close with these challenges. First of all, if you're not investing financially in the kingdom of God, prayerfully, and if you're married, do it as a couple. Don't do it individually. Prayerfully consider how much the Lord wants you to give for the work that he is doing. For some of you, this is a first step. You've never done anything like this. And I can tell you one thing, the world will not understand it. But God, 
God says, test me in this. If you're giving less than a tithe, prayerfully, prayerfully consider increasing to the tithe. Or maybe you want to go 1% or 2% up a year and just see what God does. See if God is faithful to provide. Or third, if you're giving the tithe, consider whether God is asking you to give extravagantly, to give an offering in addition to that. And finally, I think one of the biggest reasons that people are unable to give is because their, they, their debt is way too high. Their debt is so high that they're unable to give as they believe that the Lord wants them to give. Many Americans live this way. In fact, this is the top reason people give for not being able to be generous. So it says to me that God wants us to get our finances together. God wants us to handle our money God's way. So here's what I want to say to you. We're offering an amazing class called Financial Peace University. We have a table out there this morning where you can get more information or you can sign up. And here's what we want you to know. In our last class, we had 10, 10 families represented. Those 10 families paid off $38,000 of debt in nine weeks. And they saved $20,000. And they began to give as they had never given before. When we learn how to handle our money biblically, it's God knows, and he blesses us in that. Now, there is a cost. We don't make any money on it, but Financial Peace University has a kit that costs $100. Here's what I want to say to everybody here. I know that not everybody can afford that. But we've already had people step forward to say they will underwrite the cost for you to attend that class. All you have to do is to email me, and it's just between you and me, and I will take care of it from there. Sound good? And I, my wife can tell you I have a horrible memory. I will never remember that we did that, so don't be shy. <laughs> we just want you to begin learning how to be free so that your hand is not stuck for the rest of your life in this coconut. Let me close with this. Last paragraph from Christina. Listen to this. I have learned that I need to tithe, and I've learned many other things too. I need to be obedient, and that includes tithing. If I can do that, God can bless me in countless ways. Not with big bank accounts, not with fancy cars, but with what God knows is best for me. Isn't that great? I get to see God move in my life. I get to see God care and provide for me. It's amazing. When I hear that, listen to this. When I hear that people don't tithe, my heart aches for them. They are missing out on so much of what God has for them. Friends, the tithe isn't what we want from you. Giving and generosity isn't what we want from you. It's what we want from you. For you so that you can see what many of us have seen that God indeed is in control of all things and he is faithful will you pray with us father thank you for the encouragement and the challenge that this brings I know Lord many are challenged this morning and Lord I just pray that that we would not see this as the church wanting our money no we want our people to see this as an opportunity to learn more about who God is and to see God bless us in ways we never thought possible. Lord, it's my prayer that each and every one of us would be obedient. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.